Welcome everyone to a video on Native American civil rights. What we're going to focus on is we're going to focus on the significance of the presidencies of three individuals in the 1970s. Richard Nixon, Gerald Ford and Jimmy Carter. In this video, we're going to aim to do three things. We're going to recap some of the federal government's legislation in regards to Native Americans that was put forward and signed into law in the 1970s. We're then going to use that to think about the significance of this period of time for Native American civil rights. And then we'll make some broad conclusions regarding the 1970s. During the 1970s, there are really four main reasons why we see some positive changes for Native American civil rights. The first of these reasons is that, ironically, the policies of the 50s and 60s, such as termination and the encouragement of urbanization amongst Native Americans, actually creates a more united Native American movement. Second, secondly, presidents and therefore congresses of the 1970s were particularly sympathetic to Native Americans' desire for self-determination. Thirdly, the rulings of the Supreme Court at this time also established some important principles for Native American rights, giving them claims over land, reasserting the power of tribal courts and generally encouraging a respect for Native American culture. Lastly, and this is linked to point number one, the actions of Native Americans through red power movements put increasing pressure on federal governments and the Supreme Court to act in their favour. This links to number one because this is a byproduct of a more united Native American movement, which means that the actions of Native Americans become far more effective in this decade. In this video, we're going to focus on point two, though. What is the significance of the presidents of the 1970s for Native American civil rights? We're going to focus on three presidents, as we've said already. And during their presidencies, five pieces of legislation are passed that have a significant impact on Native Americans. In 1972, this is started by Richard Nixon when he publishes the Indian Education Act. This increases money for reservation schools that before this have been badly underfunded and therefore inadequate. Richard Nixon sets a precedent here because he describes Native Americans as having been deprived of their rights. And this sets in motion further legislation after his res resignation through his vice president, Gerald Ford, who takes over from him in the mid 1970s. In 1975, the Indian Self-Determination Act is published. And this sets out a process for tribes to take responsibility for their own education, health and other social services. This piece of legislation also is published at the same time as another law of 1975, the Indian Education Assistance Act, which built on Richard Nixon's law of three years previous. This allowed natives to have a greater role in their children's educational process. But it's the first of these that is particularly significant because by declaring self-determination, we are now moving away 
from an aim of assimilation for Native Americans and acknowledging that they have a right to determine their own future and how they live. Although part of a different political party, this trend is continued under Jimmy Carter because in 1978, the Native American Religious Freedom Act is published, which gives Native Americans the right to follow their traditional religion, sacred objects and rituals. Previously, this has often been viewed as very suspicious by Americans because some of these traditional dances that go with these traditional beliefs were in white American and other American people's eyes unchristian, wild, ungodly. So the Native American Religious Freedom Act is significant and follows a trend of self-determination. Lastly, we also see in 1978 the Indian Child Welfare Act being published and this regulated the forced removal of Native American children from their families. Previously, social services have been quite quick to remove Native American children from their parents. And this could often be based on a misunderstanding about expectations of parenting between different cultures. We're now going to move to the significance of the 1970s for Native American rights. As we do this, I'd encourage you to consider the use of John Partington's five criteria to assess the importance of an event or a time period as we discuss these arguments. His first criteria is, well, how important was this event or time period to people at the time? This will help you decide its importance. Secondly, how deeply did it affect people's lives? Or did it just produce kind of surface level change? Thirdly, how many people's lives were affected? Or was it just a small part of the Native American population in this case? Fourthly, did it have a long term impact? Or were the effects felt for only a short period of time and then quickly replaced or forgotten? And then lastly, how far does it influence Native American, in this context again, lives today? These five questions help you to decide the relative importance of an event or time period. So let's draw out some of the main arguments for the significance or lack of significance of the 1970s. To begin with, if we start with arguments that say the 1970s were significant, we might start here. One significant aspect of the 1970s was that Native American lands were gradually returned to tribes. This is significant because lands have been consistently taken away from tribes from 1865, the start of our course onwards. However, we have to counter this slightly by saying that although this does happen, the process is very slow and often compensation is offered instead of the return of lands. And many Native American tribes reject this. We can also counter this by saying that the process of regaining land is still very much disputed today. There are long standing claims between Native American tribes and the government and also between tribes themselves as government policy in the past has sometimes allocated land to one tribe that previously belonged to another. A second argument is that Native Americans moved nearer to self-sufficiency because of the 1970s. Tribes were able to negotiate responsibility for health, education and other social services, as said in the Indian Self-Determination Act of 1975. 
This makes the 1970s a significant period. Thirdly, we can also say that Native Americans could increasingly live according to their tribal culture. This is particularly significant because the aim of assimilation was therefore ended. Termination policy was reversed and some tribes that were terminated were actually reinstated, allowing them the right to then try and claim back land that was lost. Because of this, confidence returned to many Native American tribes, and this is reflected in their population numbers. Because in 1970, there were approximately 800,000 Native Americans in America. And by 1990, this had increased to 1.8 million. Lastly, we can also say that Native Americans were able to gain respect for their religious traditions. They now had the right to worship freely. And building on that, 30 states passed laws protecting their burial grounds and remains. However, to counter that slightly, the drug peyote, which is used for hallucinogenic religious visions, is still banned. How about the arguments that the 1970s were not a significant period of time for Native American civil rights? Well, firstly, we must say, although this is a weaker argument, that there were already signs of change before Nixon became president. In the 1960s, civil rights was obviously a very prominent agenda in US domestic politics. And President Johnson had already spoken to Congress about Native Americans being the forgotten Americans, and he had already set out a program to promote self-help and respect. Yet, that program never comes to fruition in the sense of actual results. And so we can counter this by saying the greatest changes came through the presidencies of Nixon and Ford and then later Carter. So this is an argument we can make, but it is a weaker one. A stronger argument is to say that the success of the reforms was still subject to the available levels of federal funding. To give an example of this, if we look into the 1980s, when the US economy declined, many of the reforms of the 1970s were not built upon. And so we can question quite how long lasting some of these changes were. This was also reinforced by President Reagan's belief in native capitalism. Reagan was president from 1980 to 88, and he had a strong belief in promoting profitable businesses amongst Native Americans. And the motivation for that was so that federal funding could be reduced. Some people argue, however, that Reagan's belief in self-determination empowered Native Americans. And so we could counter this. One example that's given of that is in the growth of gambling casinos on reservation lands which bring in over a billion dollars annually for Native American tribes. The final argument we could make, which again is strong, is that Native Americans are still disadvantaged today, despite the legislation of the 1970s. Education and employment levels are still very low by the end of our course in 1992, and even to this day, and Native Americans remain the poorest people group in the USA. So what conclusions can we make on the presidencies of Nixon, Ford and Carter? Well, firstly, we can say that it is true that there was some decline in the position of Native Americans in the 1980s, largely due to the economic situation. However, by 1992, the policy of assimilation has been abandoned and it has been replaced by self-determination. 
and that is of great significance. From 1865 until the 1970s, so a period of over a hundred years, assimilation has been the aim. So we can conclude that the 1970s are significant. This would suggest, therefore, that the changes made between 1970 and 78 were when support for US presidents for Native Americans was at its greatest. To put it another way, at no other point in our course have presidents been so supportive of Native American rights. Fourthly, we can say this. This demonstrates to us how influential presidential attitudes were on this people group. If US presidents were sympathetic to Native American needs, like in the 1970s, then legislation that empowered them to become self-determined and to uphold their civil rights emerged from that. Yet, we must say that how far this was just due to the attitude of government is debatable. Perhaps the best summary is to say that the 1970s were at a period of time where three factors came together at the same time to enable positive change. Firstly, presidents supported the cause and saw the past treatment of Native Americans as unfair. This was coupled with the Supreme Court being sympathetic to Native American needs and rights. Whilst thirdly, at the same time, Native Americans were united and were able to create and use powerful pressure groups to advance their rights. I'd like to finish just by talking about some historical opinions of Richard Nixon. Because one historian has argued that he has probably done more for Native Americans than any other president. I think that's largely true, but there has been some debate. Two historians that have debated this are Clifford Lyle and Vine Deloria Jr. In their book, American Indians, American Justice, they argued that both the Self-Determination and Education Acts failed to deliver the promises that they made due to a lack of funding. Stephen Corral, in his book, The Return of the Native American Indian Political Resurgence, argued that actually Native Americans gained more influence over federal actions and over their own financial resources at this time. And so he saw the 1970s as a very much more positive time than Vine Deloria and Clifford liked. This is also backed up by Donald Parman in his book, American Indi sorry, Indians in the American West in the 20th century. He argued that educational provisions had succeeded and the evidence for this was the number of community colleges that had increased to provide education for Native Americans. As said, I'm inclined to agree with that top line. Nixon has probably done more for Native Americans than any other president. But there is some debate still about this. <laughs>